This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Coldplay are probably the biggest band of the last 20 years. Love them or hate them, their eight studio albums have sold over 100 million records worldwide and have delivered hit after hit, from Yellow, yeah, they were all yellow. to The Scientist Nobody said it was easy. to Fix You. Viva La Vida, Paradise, A Sky Full of Stars, Hymn for the Weekend. The public's ears have rarely had a break from Coldplay since their debut in 2000. But despite their continued commercial success, sometime around the release of their fourth record, Viva La Vida, the world's adoration for Coldplay began to change completely. Each subsequent release saw a decline in record sales, award wins, and nominations. Their critic and user scores also began plummeting at about the same time. Nowadays, it's not uncommon for Coldplay fans to hide their adoration for the band, since being a fan somehow became a bit of a liability. So what happened? Where did they go wrong? And what is it about Coldplay that now makes critics and real music fans despise them? Well, let's take a look back on their journey and find out. What happened to Coldplay? The band were catapulted into the spotlight almost instantly. They formed in college, and after the completion of their final exams, Parlophone were offering them a five-album contract, followed by a chance to perform their new EP, The Blue Room, at Glastonbury. We live in a beautiful their sound was an evolution of the Britpop era of the mid-90s. Moody vocals atop bright, guitar-driven instrumentals, but littered with catchy pop hooks. After a short tour, the group would head into the studio to record their debut LP, Parachutes. When Coldplay released Yellow, everything would change. It was released just a month before the record's debut, and the popularity of that tender ballad ensured the rest of their album was heard. The track would eventually enter the top five of the UK singles chart, and by then, the group was drawing comparisons to Radiohead. Parachutes is a fairly beautiful alt-rock record with warm instrumentals and touching, optimistic themes. It was nominated for the Mercury Prize, going on to sell 13 million copies worldwide, and certifying itself nine times platinum in the UK. It won the Grammy for Best Alternative Album, and took home Best British Album at the Brit Awards. Following a year of promoting and touring, Coldplay felt a little uncertain of what they would produce next. But once they wrote In My Place, it helped them realize they still had the chops to craft a great tune. In my place, in my they headed to a studio in Liverpool and were now obsessed with songwriting, producing over 20 tracks for their follow-up, A Rush of Blood to the Head. Nobody said it was easy. But the band initially delayed the album, feeling that too many of the tracks sounded like ones that could fit on parachutes. So they'd rework and cut tracks until they had 10 they were finally proud of. The single Clocks would be a late addition to the track list, nearly being reserved for their third LP. But thankfully, it made the cut because it propelled that record in a similar way that Yellow did for Parachutes. Their follow-up built upon their sound with some much-needed urgency. Heavier pianos, more electric guitars, and some darker lyrics. He said, I'm gonna buy this place and burn it down. The album even helped reconcile any initial skeptics of their debut. Again, they were nominated for the Mercury Prize, eventually sold 15 million copies worldwide, certified nine times platinum in the UK, won the Grammy for Best Alternative Album, Best Rock Performance, Record of the Year, won Best British Album, and Group at the Brit Awards. If they weren't already, Coldplay were now the biggest band in the world. And Chris Martin thought it was wise to try and live up to the expectations of also being the best in the world. So after completing another tour, they were under immense pressure to deliver something that would top their previous two albums. They had written something close to 60 songs during the following sessions, but unsatisfied with those recordings, they scrapped the majority of those demos and re-recorded the album a handful of times, attempting to get it just right. They were losing their way, and it forced them to delay their third album by six months, a decision that led to their label's stock price dropping. They'd tinker with the album's 13 tracks straight to deadline. Inspired by Brian Eno, Pink Floyd, Kate Bush, and Kraftwerk, they began bringing in some dance-like additions. Their song tempos picked up. They introduced a heavier use of spacey synths. 
and even their songwriting moved towards a more philosophical view of the world. If you ever feel like something's missing. It became the best-selling album in the world that year, and finally saw them top US's Billboard 200. Again, nominated for the Mercury Prize, 13 million copies sold worldwide, certified nine times platinum in the UK, lost the Grammy for Best Rock Album to U2, the very group they began drawing comparisons to, again, won Best British Album at the Brit Awards. But still, even after its release, the New York Times called Coldplay the most insufferable band of the decade. The problem? X and Y sounded exactly like the kind of album everyone had come to expect from Coldplay. I mean, if you absolutely adored them, it was perfect. From top to bottom, it's a quality-sounding album, but nobody was really surprised by much of it. Their evolution was in the slightest. That, and with their progression moving towards a larger electronic sound and those delicate guitars of parachutes slipping further away, X and Y would alienate some. Now, imagine your Coldplay, the biggest band in the world. How do you hold on to that title? And do you even want to? Chris Martin certainly felt like they always had to outdo themselves. And so the band agreed that those first three albums would be the end of a trilogy. Moving forward, Coldplay would set out to rewrite their own rules, calling on legendary electronic producer Brian Eno to help breathe something new into the group. Brian Eno inspired the band to be more self-confident, teaching them that they didn't need to be so concerned about where they might fit in among their alt-rock peers. Eno didn't necessarily bring a new sound, as much as he encouraged new ideas of how to approach making their music. He'd split the group up and have them write in alternating pairs, and even send Chris Martin home for weeks at a time to see what the other members would produce without him. And we hear that immediate change of pace from the first track. Life in Technicolor is completely instrumental, and features a santur, an Indian string instrument. Nearly every track introduces something worthwhile and finds its place in the band's sound. Cemeteries of London adds a bit of a Spanish flair with flamenco-like hand claps. Lost sees them using tribal-like rhythms. Strawberry Swing has an Afro-pop guitar lick throughout. Even those signature Chris Martin piano ballads are completely revitalized. There's more synths, percussion, organs, and strings throughout. The track Yes has some Eastern Bollywood-type strings, but it's also the perfect example of their attempt at wanting to change their vocal identity. Martin is sitting much lower in his register here, forgoing his usual falsetto. When it started, we had high hopes. Now my back's on the line. And they begin treating his vocals in a new way. By the hidden track within Yes, the frontman is now drowned in reverb behind a wall of shoegazy guitars. And when it comes to the album's themes, there's a big shift happening here too. Viva La Vida would feature their most story-driven songwriting thus far, dealing with themes of love, war, death, loss, and revolutions. X and Y already saw them transitioning towards a more universal approach in songwriting. Viva La Vida solidified that with less personal lyrics and more thoughts on general issues and feelings of humanity. Lovers in Japan isn't really about love for another person, but rather a love for Japanese sunsets? A lot of their lyrics became much more vivid and descriptive, but relatively open-ended. Viva La Vida would be the first time the group missed a Mercury Prize nomination. It would go on to sell 10 million copies worldwide, once again giving them the best-selling album of the year. And while 10 million copies isn't anything to scoff at, it was their lowest-selling record by far. This time, they would take home the best rock album at the Grammys, Song of the Year, best vocal pop performance, and they finally scored their first number one single in the UK and the US with the title track. Viva La Vida saw Coldplay move into phase two of their careers. It was certainly the album people had hoped for after a rush of blood to the head, and Coldplay tried to challenge people by changing up their vocals, lyrical themes, adding hidden tracks, and hints of world sounds. Yet it still features most of the group's main staples of mid-tempo songs, guitar walls, piano ballads, and falsettoed vocals delivering some obscure lyrics. So despite Coldplay trying so damn hard to be something more, it's just never been enough for some. But Viva La Vida is a significant album in their discography because it was progressive for Coldplay. They would take a bit of this colorful and orchestral style and arguably dumb it down into generic pop with each following release. Paradise, paradise, paradise. 
the horribly titled Milo Xyloto saw Brian Eno return as more of a band member, helping them create a supposed thematic rock opera, but it would be the group's most pop-oriented record, where each track on Viva La Vida felt like something unique. As Milo progresses, tracks begin to blur into a colorful mush, leaving the latter half to drag to a close. But it does have its moments. Every teardrop is a waterfall is that blend of Coldplay's older magic, pairing with their new pop prowess. The album began alienating what was left of their alt-rock following because it just didn't sound like the Coldplay they'd fallen in love with. They were miles away from parachutes, but no less popular. The album was still certified five times platinum in the UK, selling over 8 million copies and received nominations for three Grammys and two Brit Awards. And just when it seemed like Coldplay were finding their new footing, they returned with Ghost Stories. Call it magic. Cut me in two, two. Where they would ditch the extravagant pop for a slight return to their more somber, melancholic tracks. It recalls the minimalism of parachutes and being much more personal and smaller but it's radically different instrumentally. In the More ambient and softer. And you would think that everyone would have been overjoyed with this somewhat return to form. Magic and Midnight are some of their most inspired tracks in a long time. It's ethereal dream pop. Me. But then we also got questionable additions like the heavy EDM crossover of A Sky Full of Stars. And aside from a few cuts, all else is fairly forgettable and lacking some real punch. Compared to their previous records, this felt a little empty. It followed Chris Martin's divorce from Gwyneth Paltrow, which should have been the cause for some deeper lyricism. And I think this album was actually the closest we'd ever get to Chris Martin, but more often than not, he trades being personal for commercial viability, and that vagueness of the subject matter only hurts this record. Coldplay got away with silly lyrics on songs like Yellow because of the captivating instrumentals around Chris Martin's words. But on Ghost Stories, there's nowhere for these words to hide. The album is so sparse instrumentally that you can't help but notice his often empty sentiments. Got a tattoo. By the end of 2014, Coldplay were named the most streamed band in the world. Although sales reflected the general disappointment towards the album, and they failed to break more than half the amount of copies Milo Xyloto delivered. And their fan and critic scores would hit an all-time low. That is, until a head full of dreams. As if responding to the criticisms of Ghost Stories, Coldplay immediately took a step back to colorful pop arrangements. If you liked Milo Xyloto, this might have been your bag. If you were happy with the direction of Ghost Stories, you were once again disappointed with the change. It's the group going through an identity crisis, wanting to come off so lively, but missing the mark, and almost sounding lifeless at times. So I put my hands up to the sky, feel the light, and got a rocket ship that I wanna ride my... It seems so overburdened by its own production, so shiny, it ends up lacking any human quality to it. Where Milo Xyloto and Ghost Stories had some redeeming tracks, there's not much saving this album, leaving nothing separating Coldplay from, say, Imagine Dragons or Maroon 5. Turn your magic on. Let me see it say. Everything By 2017, Coldplay were releasing tracks with the Chainsmokers and touring the world, declaring that A Head Full of Dreams would be their final studio album. But in 2019, Coldplay announced the double LP Everyday Life. It took an experimental rock route, but carries a number of styles. Lord, when I'm broken, when I'm broken, I'm in need, I'm in need. Lyrics are reactionary and politically charged, and there isn't an awkward EDM track stuffed into the track list. It's their least radio-friendly release to date, and in my opinion, their best and most ambitious release since Viva La Vida. It should have shattered all of those notions of Coldplay being this safe, boring band. Here was an unexpected and bold detour that might not have been perfect, but it's definitely an interesting listen, and no one heard it. And of course, not everyone was happy about it either. Many had already written off Coldplay, and whoever was left was looking for those clean pop tunes. When Coldplay needed to radically change, they would miss the mark. 
but they've survived these last 20 years because they did evolve. They just didn't transition in ways some would have expected. And when they finally did, no one paid attention. But at every turn, another group was always doing what Coldplay were, just slightly better. Radiohead, Grizzly Bear, Arcade Fire, Fleet Foxes, Bon Iver. All brought more interesting and personal takes on melancholic alternative rock during Coldplay's career. So while the masses continued to admire the latest Coldplay record, music nerds and critics were being exposed to some exceptional creativity and songwriting that just overshadowed Coldplay's releases. So it's not that Coldplay ever went wrong. Quite the contrary, they've done everything right. We just moved on every time they took a step we didn't like. They're a band who have commendably tried to outperform their past selves every time. Being the biggest band in the world is a lot of pressure, and with it comes a high level of expectation. The constant polarizing reception made it difficult for the band to just focus on and enjoy what they were doing. And instead, it seemed to have them trying to appease everyone. I hope they learn to ignore what their audience wants, because we clearly have no idea what we even want from Coldplay. Thanks for watching, ladies and gents. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you loved it, hit that bell so you're notified when the next episode goes live. There are now five episodes of the Middle Eight Madness podcast, and you can find it wherever you get your podcast fix. So if you want to hear me debating over music with Polyphonic, Alpha Media, Vinyl Rewind, and others, you can find a link to that below. My creator friends and I have also teamed up to build our own streaming platform called Nebula, where we don't have to worry about copyright claims and how much music we use in our videos. It's getting more difficult to use any amount of music on YouTube, period. So Nebula allows us as creators to continue doing what we love to do, and that's creating without limitations. On Nebula, our content is ad-free, and even a bit more experimental since we don't have to worry about YouTube's algorithms and those copyright issues. And we've partnered with CuriosityStream to keep making it happen. If you're looking for the best documentaries on the internet, they're on CuriosityStream. The platform loves educational content and educational creators. So much so that we worked out a deal where if you sign up with the link below, you'll get CuriosityStream with Nebula for free. As long as you have CuriosityStream, you'll have Nebula. And right now, CuriosityStream is offering a 26% discount on their annual plan. That's $14.79 for both CuriosityStream and Nebula for the whole year. You're going to be staying inside during quarantine anyway. Might as well learn something new. Listen to David Attenborough share the wonders of nature. Let Chris Hadfield explain and condense the unimaginable scale of space. Or find out, can a computer write a hit musical? Head to the link in the description below to get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off. Or you can head to curiositystream.com slash middle eight. It really helps support this channel and educational content in general for just less than 15 bucks a year. But tell me, what do you think about Coldplay's career? Let me know in the comments below. And follow us at more middle eight on Twitter and Instagram for more middle eight. But that's it for me. Again, thanks for watching and keep listening.